A few days back, uh, one of my students on Facebook, he wrote a comment uh, in one of the posts. I uh, forgot exactly what he wrote, against which I uh, made a reply. And then he made a comment to my reply, saying that, Ma'am, I was saying in a casual way, I know you are a feminist, but um, it was only plain fun. And I wrote to him, that, well, dear, you have been for three years in my classroom. You are definitely a feminist then. And then I was wondering uh, that it's very important, I guess, to discuss with you what feminist is and how to look at the word feminism because it's often the most misunderstood word in the world. Welcome to our channel Hindu Pop and today in this video we are going to talk about some of the things which we should know about feminism, feminist movements and what is so special about today, the 8th of March, which we are celebrating as International Women's Day. There are countless definitions of feminism available in Google. Baffling, you get so confused. Which is the right definition? What does it mean uh, when we use the expression Feminist criticism, feminist theory. Well, take it in this way. Feminism, or rather I should say any ism, it's like spectacles, eyeglasses, or even better, looking glass, magnifying glass. When we look at something with our naked eyes, we often miss many things. But when we take a magnifying glass and, well, look through it, we get aware of different shades, different particles, different aspects of that same thing. Ism is like that. There is nothing in this world which we can brand as a feminist text. There is only something called feminist reading of a text. That is, when you are wearing those glasses of feminism, when you are looking through that magnifying glass of feminism to look at the same text which has been there for like forever. So for a feminist reading you don't need a text which is written after the emergence of the so-called feminist movement. You can make a feminist reading of the Mahabharata and that is the beauty of any ism. It doesn't care about when something was written. But when we talk about feminist movement, that is a technical term. And usually people try to classify movements according to stages or historical sequence. Now, usually it is customary to see the different moments, important moments in feminist movement as waves. Many of you are familiar with the terms first wave feminism, second wave feminism, third wave feminism. And often the differences between these waves, they might appear confusing. Now, when we talk about these waves, do not assume that there was no women's voice before these waves started. As early as 1792, we have Mary Wollstonecraft writing this book called A Vindication of the Rights of Women. We have books by men, books by John Stuart Mill on the subjection of women. So voices of women, voices speaking in favor of women, uh, they were always there. But when we talk about movement, that means there has to be a mass effect or it has to be something which involves more than one individual. Mary Wollstonecraft was an individual. 
although a very powerful voice. She was the mother of Mary Shelley, Mary Shelley who wrote Frankenstein. Now, before going into the details about when the first wave started, when the second wave started, let me first talk about uh, this word wave. When and why was this word first used? In 1968, a person called Martha Winman, she wrote in uh, one of her columns in the New York Times, an article. And the headline was, The Second Feminist Wave. Nobody before her used the expression first feminist wave. So she straight away started talking about the second feminist wave before anybody talked about any first wave. Why did she do this? Because in and around 1968, she was getting aware that women were talking about things in a different way than what the women were talking about earlier during the time which we now call the first wave. Historically, we can say that the period between 1848 to 1920 is approximately the timeline for the first wave of feminism. Why 1848? What happened then? It was the year of the Seneca Falls Convention. 200 women they gathered at a church and uh, they started talking about different kinds of rights that women should have. And uh, they passed something around 12 resolutions, out of which a very important resolution, after much debate that was passed, was the right to vote. Women during that time did not have the right to vote like men did. The two prominent leaders among those 200 women were Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Stanton. Now, incidentally, these two women were also very prominent faces of the abolitionist movement. What is abolitionist movement? The anti-slave movement. During the time in America, uh, there were slaves, there were colored people, who were enslaved, made to work for white men, and they had no rights at all. So these two women, who I mentioned earlier, they were not only the prominent figures of women movement or women-centric movement, but also movement that involved the plea or the revolt against enslavement of colored people. So there was kind of an integration of these two movements. They were working hand in hand because you know, both talked against discrimination in a way. And there was a friendly parallel uh, marriage of movements that was going on till 1870. What happened in 1870? In 1870, black men who were erstwhile slaves, they were granted the right to vote. Now these white women who were like very prominent faces of women's rights to vote, they thought, excuse us, what are you thinking? And they actually made statements like, field workers can decide who the government will be and cultured women like us don't have any clue how we can participate in it. That's racist. So it's a very fine line which the white women crossed and a rift developed. Okay, their anger was legitimate but their expressions cannot be justified under any circumstances. Especially because the way they behaved with their fellow black women, colored women, that is plain injustice. Because the black men were granted the right to vote, the white women ostracized the black women. Even in their marches, these colored women or these black women, they were asked to walk behind the white women. So this is what a movement looks like. This is what 
any kind of idea looks like. It always progresses at the cost of something else. So while we celebrate feminism, we cannot celebrate this version of feminism. Nonetheless, this movement was effective in a way. It took quite a long time. You know, it was not until uh, early 20th century that voting rights were granted to women. Yes, to all women, but in reality it was seen that black women had more trouble when they exercise their right to vote. A very important book which we associate with this first wave is A Room of One's Own by Virginia Woolf. It was published in 1929. And here Virginia Woolf talks about economic independence as the true empowering factor for women to get their rights. Now this was in line with the Marxist way of thinking. Virginia Woolf also talked about language being something very gendered, you know, controlled by man, patriarchy. Uh, and this idea was developed later by other writers. Virginia Woolf's point uh, is practically seen in case of, uh, especially in case of the revolutions that were going on around Russia during the time. And it was also a very interesting time period, no, 1918s and 19s. What was happening to the world during the time, the First World War? And what happened during the First World War? Men were asked to leave their jobs and go to fight for their nations. Able-bodied men, men who were working in the factories. The men were gone, but the demand for the goods that are produced in the industry, especially in heavy metal industries, in clothing industries, in food industries, the demand was not reduced, rather it increased during wartime. So how was that deficit of labor? You know, now that the men were gone to fight, there was a deficit created. So how was that deficit addressed? The women were employed in the industries. So far, so good. Virginia Woolf uh, later on talked about economic independence. So you might think that, good, women are now asked to work outside homes. So they must be very happy. Well, they could have been happy if they were paid same as men. But they were denied equal pay. What was the ground? Why were they denied equal pay? They were given this peculiar reason that Men are physically stronger, so for a certain duration of time, that is duty hours, they could produce more goods. So they could be paid more, while women being weaker, uh, they cannot have that kind of output. So we are paying less, justified according to this strange kind of logic. This was the discrimination at workplace which definitely was countered by revolting voices. And it was also the time of the Russian Revolution. And in February Revolution, uh, when there was this uh, massive socialist upsurge of sentiments in Russia going on, you know, people were striking against the authorities. It was during that time, in 1917 to be specific, a Russian woman, Marfa Vasileva, working in a factory, decided to stop working in support of the revolters. And the authorities, they, uh, you know, said, fine, it's okay, you don't have to work. And they offered her a loaf of bread. She accepted the bread, but did not go back to work. She said that what about the other women workers in the factory? And then her movement or her revolt kind of spread like wildfire. Other women, they stopped working. And then the men working in the factory, they stopped working. So it was like one stone dropping in a silent pond 
causing that grand ripple. So while this first wave uh, helped women gain things like you know voting rights, right to property, earlier women did not have right to their father's property, right to education and employment, uh, well that again led to those uh, cases of injustice where they were employed but the payment was far far less than men employees and very importantly it also made women get at least some access to reproductive rights. In 1916, a woman called Margaret Sanger, she opened a birth clinic. And during the time, use of contraceptive was severely banned, rather, you can see it was socially unacceptable. Why? Because Motherhood was considered to be the most glorified point of being a woman. For most people it still is. If you are from India, you know how the concept of Mother India you know, made people of India unite as if it is their duty to protect the mother. A woman's life is considered, still even today, is considered to be complete when she creates another human being. The nurturing, nourishing aspect of woman, which is ironically considered to be an asset, becomes a liability when that glorification becomes a handicap. So while the first wave created a space for women politically, there were issues and challenges that were kept hanging. Above everything else, we are left with the question, what about that rift between the rich and the poor, between the white and the black? In the second wave, was this rift reduced? Was this gap diminished? What do we call the starting point of the second wave? In 1949, the book, by Simone de Beauvoir, The Second Sex was published. Very dense academic book. The gist of the book is, one is not born a woman, one becomes one. This means that being a female is a biological reality. Your body makes you a male or a female and yes, of course, a third gender, but in society, that makes you a woman. Now Simone de Beauvoir was French, dense, hard to understand and therefore not instantly popular. It was in 1963 that the book The Feminine Mystic by Betty Friedan that had that massive reach, it went viral, 3 billion copies sold that started to have a great impact. What was that book about? It was about the problem that has no name. Yes, she wrote those words. The problem that has no name. The problem of the woman who lives in the domestic sphere. It's about the difference in the way a woman lives her life and a man lives his life. The political outside relevant world of the man and the docile, domestic, submissive world of the woman where if the woman is feeling unhappy, she is made to feel that either you are mad or you are guilty. Three million readers reading this started to look at themselves. This was not Simone de Beauvoir. This was not going above their heads. This was about them. This was about them wiping the floors, making the dish. And they realized that they were angry. So this book had a unifying effect. The effect which led to this popularization of the concept that personal is political. You can go outside on a march, 
rallying against something grand but the real battles are fought inside the doors of your bedroom of your kitchen interestingly this was not something new in um, 1879 we have henry ibsen's book a doll's house nora leaving her household dashing out ibsen throwing at us an incident and asking us to question this not making any value judgment but the reception of a doll's house was not what it should have been people did not look at nora as a rebel they looked at nora as a doll the expression personal is political it was i don't know who made it first there's no written record but the person who popularized it was carol hanish the whole point of this second wave is that while the first wave was more uh, you know politically motivated they wanted uh, something political like you know right to vote and some legislative changes including these rights to properties and stuff something which they wanted the authority to sanction them so in a way first wave feminists or first wave women uh, voices uh, they were appealing to men because women were not in a position to make any changes so they had to depend on men benevolent men in the second wave it was more cultural it was more about your home your relationship your dynamics more interiorized yes there were legal changes or legal achievements to it's not just uh, you know cultural sphere uh, that we see the effect of second wave in so far as the legal battles that were won during this time uh, important ones include equal pay the equal pay act was passed in 1963 i'm talking about america but it kind of had a ripple effect throughout the world this equal pay act we have a uh, right to birth control because women are not baby machines motherhood is a very good thing fine but that is not the only point of being alive and a very important thing educational equality the right to education another very important work written during this time uh, came out in 1969 it was by kate millet and it's called the sexual politics although we call this phase a cultural phase the idea that political identity goes hand in hand with personal identity this idea was the you can say main usp of the second wave feminist movement kate millet in her book she actually writes about the ways in which uh, you know this patriarchal system it manipulates power and how that leads to subjugation of women but what was the question we were asking ourselves before we started talking about second wave was the rift reduced the difference between rich and the poor the difference between black and white what was betty friedan's book about or on it was about white privileged housewives what about the working women they had no problem with you know being stuck at home they were never stuck at home they were forced to work they were never asked to give birth after birth because they were forced to sterilize themselves it's never a single agenda that makes a movement successful so while the second wave feminism brought a lot of changes it did not address the basic problem of discrimination when the english men were ruling india they were deliberately making use of this divide and rule concept make a division between the hindus and the muslims and you know they'll just keep fighting with each other and never talk against us because they will lose all their energy fighting each other so this divide between white women and black women 
it did not help in empowerment of women it helped in sustaining of patriarchy and is kind of a strategy i'm using this word strategy deliberately because this was a time when michel foucault was writing and he was talking about the way power works he was talking of history of sexuality he was talking about imprisonment madness and he was showing us how history is nothing but figment of imaginations of historiographers who wants you to believe what they write history is never a single truth it is a combination of versions different people writing from different points of view the problem with second wave is that it not only kept that gap intact between the privileged and the uh, you can say proletariats but it also created this this magnified image of the feminist woman as almost a medusa figure a monster a man hater you know lonely depressed angry all the time aggressive woman and that image was kind of a deterrent deterrent means something which keeps people away oh you are a feminist so you want to kill men so let me be away from you many women even now they begin talking in this way you know i am not a feminist but as if being a feminist is a taboo and this image is responsible for that taboo and that is why the third wave emerged to to work against this taboo to make this gap reduce if not disappear so you see the three waves they are not watertight compartments they flow into each other questions raised in the first wave are addressed in the second wave questions raised in the second wave are addressed in the third wave and so on when you call something a wave you imagine it as a monolithic structure as if it doesn't have different shades different dimensions as if it only is made of same kind of water molecules but no that is the biggest strategy of patriarchy to give you the illusion that feminism is a monolithic concept a two feminists are monsters and this whole idea of discussing about women is something which we do on 8th march and all these three things they help patriarchy to continue the third wave feminism is not feminism at all it is rather feminisms plural because the first and the foremost thing the most important character of the third wave feminism or rather the third wave feminisms is the plurality the celebration of plurality that being different is something to celebrate agenda wise it focused mostly on workplace harassment so you see it's like a like a sequence earlier they didn't have this access to workplace then they got that access when they went there they see that we don't have equal pay and then they get equal pay and then they see that i'm getting equal pay but i'm getting harassed and not just sexual harassment it's like a strange kind of harassment what kind of harassment if you look at the situation of uh, academia even in 2022 you will see that uh, so far as the profession of teaching is concerned more women are employed than men so we can say we can assume that it's a women dominated uh, area of work career option but so little involvement is seen women's involvement is seen when it comes to the governing positions policy making positions of education sector how many women are working at the top rung of the ugc at the top rung of the higher education department of the states 
that is not dominated by women. So this is how you know one kind of achievement leads to the awareness of the next kind of non-achievement. And that is what we call progress. And you might see it in this way that, okay, we have given you right to work. Now you complain about payment. We have given you equal payment. Now you want to be the CEO of the office. Yes, we want to be. Because we are not asking you to make us CEOs because we are women. We are asking you to make us CEOs because we deserve it. All the women whose voices mattered in any feminist movement or women's movement, all these voices were not about celebrating being a woman. They did not want any advantage from society that, see, I'm a woman, so give me this advantage. They wanted to be not a woman. They wanted to be treated as a non-gendered entity. They were not asking for ladies' compartments. They were asking for the ability to voice if any male passenger harassed them. So what is, what is the woman's day all about? Is it about rejection of womanhood or is it about celebrating womanhood? You see the third wave, it integrates in it. It puts in combination with its own theories, the theories of Marxism, psychoanalysis, and then so many other theories like post-structuralism, post-colonialism, deconstruction. Why? Why does Gayatri Chakraborty Spivak, she puts in the theories of Derrida in a text by Mahasheta Devi on a woman's condition, a woman who belongs to the margins of a society. Because she knows that this is how any ism grows, by accommodating other isms. So you cannot look at feminism without seeing it in empathy with other kinds of magnifying glasses or isms. And therefore, now that we are talking about feminisms, we have different other kinds of classifications. We have different other kinds of ways to look at this progress of feminism. You know, sometimes it is said that there are three phases called the biological female phase, then we have the feminist phase, and then we have the feminine phase. So this is one way of seeing the phases. Then we have this concept of liberal feminism, then radical feminism, who actually literally want to kill men, <laughs> according to many people. We have cultural feminism, we have black feminism, who prefer to use the term womanism. Why? Because the word feminism somehow sounds very French and French sounds very, well, privileged. And then, of course, there is this neo-Marxist feminism because how can feminism survive without being socialist or connected to socialism? So, what emerges from the concept of third wave feminism is that it celebrates plurality. Now, because it celebrates plurality, no matter how many different kinds of movements or shades or variations come, it will always fall inside the radius of the third wave. And maybe that's why many people say that the third wave is still continuing. Although some people say that, uh, you know, this Me Too movement, this has brought in a whole new dimension to it. And this has kind of generated the phase of the fourth wave. Uh, it's a phase where uh, we don't celebrate just being a woman. We celebrate sexual identity and the freedom to choose one's sexual identity. So that's what today is about. Celebration of identity. Today being the 8th March of 2022, the theme is break the bias. Whose bias? Who is biased against whom? Bias means when you have a prejudgment of somebody, you, you are uh, not impartial, that is, you are biased. So who is biased against whom? Men biased against women? Women biased against women? Why not women biased against the third gender? The bias of feminists against non-feminists and conformists. My point is, I think the best way to celebrate today is to give absolute freedom. 
to everybody. If you have the right to be a feminist, you also have the right to be a conformist, to enjoy the pleasures of patriarchy. Unless and until you are hurting somebody else's freedom, of course, then that is objectionable. And the question of choice. There is a lot of controversy going on about, uh, you know, this wearing a hijab is good or not. The point is, if we are demanding freedom for ourselves, we should be ready to accept and acknowledge the freedom of others. If that wearing of hijab, burqa, pagri, whatever, sari, and then we Bengalis, uh, we wear these uh, conch uh, bangles, shakha pala, sindur, unless it is forced on somebody, if it is just a choice, then questioning that choice, calling it uh, something uh, that needs to be, you know, de-brainwashed, that is against today's feminism. Because today's feminism is about plurality. The problem, the root cause of the problem is, I think, defining feminism. The moment you define feminism, you limit it, you restrict it, you put conditions on it and you create that Medusa figure. Definition leads to branding. When you brand somebody that you are a feminist and then you exclude that person as a no fun person. Leave it undefined and you can celebrate its plurality. That's why I started to define uh, feminism in the very beginning of the video, but I didn't define it at all. I only talked about the stages in which it has emerged in history. If we call this a fourth wave period with that Me Too movement and women coming so much more now in politics, not just for voting rights, but for being candidates for whom men are voting. Although we do not have yet any woman president in the great United States of America, but we proudly as Indians can say that yes, we have had a very remarkable woman as our prime minister. And such, uh, uh, you can say, accomplishment is there for Sri Lanka. For Bangladesh, so-called third world countries, we are celebrating Women's Day as a celebration of plurality. But personally, I believe that unless the day comes when women shareholders, they grab a considerable proportion that run the economy of a nation, unless that day comes, we will have to keep celebrating 8th March. 8th March happens to be a national holiday for Russia. We should give credit where credit is due. And in every socialist country and every communist state, this day is celebrated. But unless that day comes, we will keep uploading videos every 8th March speaking about women's issues, women's voices, women's resistance, what it means to be a feminist and why unknowingly you are a very big supporter already. So this is all for today. This is Monami Mukherjee signing off. Thank you and I wish everybody irrespective of your genders, a very happy International Women's Day because, as I've said, this is about we Men's Day. Thank you once again. See you all in my next video. Till then, stay happy, stay safe. Thank you.